and it's my great pleasure to welcome you to the second talk in J.B. Anderson's series, Turning Points in the American Presidency. This is a Tuesday Scholar event. Today's speaker, historian J.B. Anderson, has long been a very popular speaker at our History Talks. His ongoing series of programs on the U.S. presidents are some of the best attended history events in our area. We are pleased, in fact, that remote programming opportunities have made it possible for the library to begin to co-sponsor his series, and I hope you'll join us in January 2021 when he'll begin some new segments on George W. Bush and his administration. But today, he's here to talk about turning points in the history of presidential elections. JB's appearance today is made possible through the co-sponsorship of the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute of the University of Minnesota with financial support from the Friends of the Ramsey County Libraries. We are deeply grateful to both these organizations. Before I turn the virtual podium over to JB, I'd like to talk just a little bit about the technical aspects of this webinar. Today, we are using the Zoom webinar platform. You should see controls either at the bottom of the screen or at the top, although they may be hidden until you move your cursor or touch the screen. Although your mic is turned off for this webinar, the chat box is available if you need some help with technical issues. You can open the chat box by clicking on the chat balloon icon. If you don't see that chat icon in your control bar, it may be hidden in the ellipses, the three dots. The Q&A box is available for questions on the content of the talk. Feel free to type in your questions at any time throughout the presentation, but we'll ask JB to wait until the end of his remarks before he turns to answering the questions. I will read the questions for JB to answer. If you'd like to make use of the closed captioning option to view subtitles for this talk, you can click on the CC a button in the lower right hand corner of your screen. This program runs for about an hour and a half, including both JB's presentation and the time for questions. We are recording this event for those who are not able to be present for this webinar. The recording will be made available on our website within a few days. We already have the recording from last week mounted on our website. Thanks very much. And now I'd like to turn things over to our speaker, J.B. Anderson. I assume you can hear me. Let me get my uh, slides up and running. Uh, give me a second here. Uh, today, um, the title is uh, Entrenched Political Parties in Fighting and Outfighting. And this is about um, groups uh, of people uh, from uh, basically 1824 to the present and uh, concerning how elections get decided. Um, there was a question on faithless electors that we didn't get to last week and they're, they're starting uh, uh, they are people who uh, get their votes canceled or they change them in some way. Uh, there's a total of 32 states that have laws against this, but only 15 of the states have any uh, consequences uh, for faithless electors. Uh, there's an article that I'm going to post. Whoops, I need to go back. Hang on, there we go. Um, I'll post that article uh, after uh, class. Um, the uh, election's not decided by the Electoral College. Uh, what we're gonna cover today is uh, the election of 1824, uh, the election of 1876, which was really a biggie. So we have kind of some subtopics uh, we'll talk about the candidates, the results of the election, the Wormley House Agreement, the Committee of 1877, nicknames that developed for Hayes, and the Hayes 
inauguration. Then we'll talk about the elections of 1960, 72, 2000, and 2004. So the election of 1824. Uh, first thing we're going to talk about is the 12th Amendment, and this will deal with, uh, one of the things that will deal with is reporting uh, the electoral votes, which was a question also from last week. Uh, what's the 12th Amendment about? Uh, the first thing it says is the president and vice president have to be from different states. Uh, a lot of people think this was violated in 2000, 2004, because both W. Bush and Cheney were from Texas. Now, Cheney uh, had a great deal of wealth. He'd been the CEO of uh, companies, including Halliburton. So he had more than one home. And he claimed that uh, Wyoming was his residence where he had a house but uh, he had always voted in Texas and he had lived there a majority of the year. Uh, second uh, element of the 12th Amendment is that electors vote in their uh, home state and then they trans transmit the results to the president of the Senate. There'd been a lot of ways of reporting. This kind of clarified it down to a single individual, the president of the Senate. Uh, and the president of the Senate happens to be the vice president of the United States. Now, a person with a majority of electoral votes becomes the president. Uh, that's another aspect of the 12th Amendment. Uh, if there's no majority, for the President of the United States, then you take the top three candidates and you send their names to the House of Representatives and the election is then decided in the House of Representatives. Um, and each state gets a single vote and a majority wins. Uh, if there's no president, by the time of the inauguration, which at the time of the 12th Amendment was March 4th, another amendment to the Constitution changed that to January 20th in the 1930s. Uh, so no president by the inauguration date, then the sitting vice president becomes president until the decision about the November election has been made. And uh, in, in this case, that's uh, Dick Cheney, currently called Mikey the Fly Pence. Uh, I said that wrong, it's not Dick Cheney, it's Mike Pence. Uh, if there's uh, no majority for the vice president, then the top three candidates' names are sent to the Senate and the Senate decides who the vice president will be. Now, at the time of the 12th Amendment, uh, the president and vice president did not run together. Whoever placed, uh, people could run for vice president, but whoever placed second for the presidency was named the vice president. So it could be people of two different political parties. Uh, the election of 1824, next thing we'll talk about is the candidates. This is the only election that's ever been thrown in to the uh, United States House of Representatives. Andrew Jackson, John Quincy Adams, William Crawford, and Henry Clay. And uh, uh, these uh, four candidates, none received a majority either of the popular votes or of the electoral votes. So we go to the House of Representatives. And uh, this shows the vote totals. Uh, it's a lot of stuff on a chart to have to look at. Uh, but uh, the popular vote totals uh, and the electoral votes on the far right kind of tell the story. On the far right, 
you can see at the very bottom, you need 131 electoral votes in 1824 to win the presidency. Andrew Jackson had 99. John Quincy Adams, 84. And William Harris Crawford had 41. No one receiving a majority of 131. So who's William Crawford? Let's talk about him for a minute. He, he finished fourth in the popular vote, but third in electoral votes. Uh, he lived from 1772 to 1834, 52 years old. Um, he was a senator from Georgia in 1807. In these days, senators were picked by state legislatures. It wasn't until the 19 teens that we started to elect them by popular vote. He was also the president pro tem of the Senate, so he was a leader among his uh, colleagues. He was uh, acting vice president in 1812 and 13. The vice president of the United States had died, and next in line at that time was the president pro tem of the Senate. That's been changed. Third in line now is the Speaker of the House of Representatives. Crawford was also um, the ambassador to France for a couple of years. He was uh, Secretary of War for a couple of years and Secretary of the Treasury. Uh, Jackson had led in the um, electoral votes. Henry Clay was uh, at the bottom and uh, Clay said about Jackson, I cannot believe that killing 2,500 Englishmen at New Orleans qualifies for the various difficult and complicated duties of the chief magistracy. In other words, uh, this guy was a military person. He doesn't know about uh, politics. Uh, Clay was uh, Speaker of the House, and was uh, where, and that's where the election was decided. So here you've got one of the candidates who's in charge of looking around, taking the vote, uh, telling what states to vote and when, and so on. Uh, so his support was no small thing, and he ended up uh, not liking Jackson so much that he threw his support uh, to John Quincy Adams. He simply told the people in the House of Representatives, if you support me, don't vote for me. Vote for John Quincy Adams instead. Uh, Adams then, when he was indeed elected by the House, uh, he named uh, Henry Clay as his Secretary of State. Well, this certainly looked like some sort of big deal had been made. Uh, in other words, uh, throw your support to me and I'll make you Secretary of State. Historically, this is known as the corrupt bargain. Uh, Clay and uh, John Quincy Adams both said, we never made any such bargain, uh, but most people doubted that. Uh, Elections not decided by the Electoral College. We're going to do 1876, and this is a biggie. Let's look at the candidates first. <clears throat> this is James G. Blaine. Uh, the Republican Party had been founded in 1854, uh, elected its first president, Abraham Lincoln, in 1860, ran its first candidate in 1856, and that was John C. Fremont. Uh, well, here's uh, James G. Blaine, <clears throat> and he's expected to be the nominee. So let's uh, tell a little bit about him and then go to the uh, Republican Convention. He was the Speaker of the House of Representatives for eight years, and twice had been appointed Secretary of State, and he had been elected by the uh, Congress in the state of Maine. Uh, 
uh, to be the senator from that state. Uh, the other leading candidate who was nominated for the Republican presidential bid was Oliver P. Morton. So the two of them are at the Republican convention and it gets deadlocked. Nobody's getting the necessary number of votes. So the Republican party says, okay, the heck with this. The convention said, we're throwing out these two guys and they turned to a dark horse candidate, uh, Rutherford B. Hayes. Uh, Blaine eventually received the 1884 nomination. So this is eight years later. And uh, he lost the general election to Grover Cleveland. <clears throat> uh, one of the reasons there was difficulty at the um, Republican convention for Blaine was due to railroad corruption. Today, this could be any corporate giant, really, but uh, the, the railroad corruption involved, um, uh, we're gonna, the United States uh, Congress giving land to the railroad so they could build on it. At one time, the railroads owned one fourth of all the land in the United States and it had been given to them. Uh, so railroads were given this tremendous amount of land. Uh, politicians in exchange for these considerations to the railroads were given stocks. Many of them became uh, pretty wealthy uh, as a result. Um, and uh, that, that made people concerned about Blaine and, uh, and his possible corruption and involvement. Uh, it's corporate ownership of the United States. Sure glad that stopped. Uh, his, uh, take a look at this picture of Blaine. Historians have been polled many times about who's the greatest military leader of all time. And they have said it is Napoleon. Now, this is 55 years after the death of Napoleon. He died in 1821. Here's an 1876 photo of Blaine, and he's got that uh, same stance that Napoleon often stood around doing. There's no photographs of Napoleon. It had, photography hadn't been invented yet, but there are paintings of him, and he has his hand inside the shirt, such as this stance, which was very popular among politicians all throughout the 1800s. Uh, the cam there was a campaign uh, chant against Blaine, and this uh, campaign chant was done at the Republican convention. Blaine, Blaine, James G. Blaine, the continental liar from the state of Maine. Uh, here's Rutherford B. Hayes. Uh, since Blaine and Morton, uh, were deadlocked, neither being able to get the votes necessary to be the Republican nominee. That went to Rutherford B. Hayes, who you see here. His opponent in the Democratic Party was uh, Samuel Tilden, and he was expected to win. Nobody thought Hayes would win. Hayes was an unknown quantity. He was the dark horse. Uh, people didn't know who he was, didn't know his record, nothing. Uh, a little side note here, Samuel Tilden was one of the three founders of what became the New York City Public Library. Um, the other people were members of the Astor and Lennox families, and they donated their entire personal libraries to this building in New York City, it's just a couple blocks off of uh, Times Square. I uh, have spent a lot of time in this building. Uh, in 1901, <clears throat> it became a free lending library. Prior to that, you had to pay to join it. And if you wanted to loan a book, 
you'd have to pay some sort of fee. Uh, a free lending library, which was started originally in Philadelphia by Benjamin Franklin, is a library where there's, there's no membership fee, and the only fees are if you don't return the book, you have to pay for it, or if you return it late, there are some fines. Uh, so anyway, I've been at this place <clears throat> doing research for the University of Minnesota. <clears throat> it's a stunning, gorgeous uh, place. Here's a photo taken from a walkway, a hallway, uh, down <clears throat> into the a stairway area. You can see uh, what a monumental piece of architecture this place is. Uh, there's more, more diversion here. Uh, anytime you do research at a lot of these places, presidential libraries or even public libraries, you're interviewed by someone who says, yes, go ahead, uh, that's fine, you can do research here. A lot of attention is given to people from major universities, so I'd show my uh, university uh, calling card and they'd say, oh, great, yeah. And uh, the woman that interviewed me even led me up to this research room and uh, she uh, sat me down and she said, um, I want you to meet somebody, uh, just a second. So she went off and came back with Barbara Tuchman. Barbara Tuchman is a non-academic historian and uh, one of her most famous books is A Distant Mirror, The Calamitous 14th Century. Lots of people uh, in the uh, late 1900s were saying, this has been such a horrible century, we're never gonna survive it. Two world wars, a cold war, and the 1918 flu pandemic. And so Barbara Tuchman wrote this book about the 1300s, which had the Black Plague for four years, 1347 to 51, and lots of wars. And she said, see, we survived the 1300s. Um, there, uh, she she, she uh, sat with me for 10 or 15 minutes. She said, do you see that old lady over there? So I looked, yes. She said, she's been doing research here for 40 years, and she has, <clears throat> she has about 8,000 index cards, uh, and she's writing a book on Franklin Roosevelt, but um, Barbara Tuchman then said, she doesn't know when the research should stop. So the results of the election of 1876, a uh, lot of numbers here, uh, what's important is the difference. Uh, Tilden won the popular vote by uh, 254,000 votes. He, the percentage for that is 47.9 uh, for Hayes and 51 for Tilden, meaning Tilden won uh, with a 3.1% advantage in the popular vote. But the winner, is Rutherford Hayes. Well, how the heck did that happen? Uh, here again, Tilden wins by over uh, 250,000 votes, but he didn't get to take office. Uh, a meeting occurs at the Wormley House. This is the Wormley House. Just a second, I wanna check back here, okay. Uh, that's one block from Lafayette Square and the White House. Um, Lafayette Square is a park that's located uh, on the same street as the White House. So one entire side of Lafayette Park faces the White House. I've uh, walked around Lafayette Park. It's a pretty famous place in American history. Uh, William Seward lived there. He was um, Secretary of State under Lincoln. He's the guy that uh, bought Alaska, 
known as Seward's Folly. And um, uh, when Lincoln was assassinated, there were people appointed to assassinate all the cabinet members too. But the only cabinet member they got near was Seward. Uh, a man broke into his house and uh, found Seward and stabbed him uh, several times. And uh, Seward survived. Uh, Dolly Madison, after ja her husband James Madison died, lived in Lafayette Square. And Stephen Rensselaer uh, had a house on Lafayette Square. He was a great hero of the War of 1812. Uh, the Wormley House, uh, and this is amazing, it's 1876, it was owned by a black man, uh, James uh, Wormley, shown here. And it's where the 1876 election got decided. What happened was the election was over. It was apparent that Tilden had won. But one of the Republican leaders telegraphed uh, other Republican leaders in three states, South Carolina, Florida, and Louisiana. And um, he said, hold the votes for your state. Don't report the electoral votes. So they didn't. Then representatives from these states met with uh, Republicans at the Wormley House. Uh, these, you know, the South was voting for Democrats because it was the Republican Party that got rid of slavery. So these Southern Democrats and these leading Republicans who want uh, Hayes to win uh, meet. And one of the Republicans uh, that was on this committee that met with these Southerners was James Garfield, who five years later would be president of the United States. Uh, the, they, they come to uh, an agreement that involves six major items. First of all, all federal troops are gonna be removed from the South. Uh, the South had seceded from the Union. It had started a war against the North. We have to prevent this from happening. The South cannot rise again. Every uh, town in the South larger than 20,000 people had federal troops stationed in it, in some cities on each street corner even. So uh, the South, of course, didn't like this. So the first uh, compromise item was we'll remove the federal troops from the South. Second was we'll end Reconstruction. No more teaching blacks to read and write. They can't own property. Uh, there are blacks currently in the United States Senate and the House of Representatives. Uh, we'll try to make sure they can't vote, et cetera. Uh, we place uh, blacks in the hands of you folks in the South. So reconstruction will end and did. Uh, we'll appoint one Southerner to the new Republican president, Rutherford B. Hayes's uh, cabinet, and that got done. Uh, this is David Key of Tennessee. He became the postmaster general position that no longer exists uh, as a cabinet member. Uh, we'll build a railroad across the South. Uh, the, the South, uh, and I'm, I'm gonna flip to the next one here, we'll also industrialize the South. See, the South had been agricultural tobacco and cotton. And the, um, uh, what the uh, North is saying is, we'll help industrialize you. We'll get some railroads built there and some industries, and you won't have to get your uh, crops to port cities uh, via mule trains or horse-drawn or oxen carts. Uh, so that'll be quicker for you. And uh, we'll build some businesses there in the South, uh, manufacturing stuff, so you won't be so dependent on the North for manufactured goods. Uh, in exchange for all of this, the three Southern states had to agree 
to cast all their electoral votes for Hayes, who is pictured here. Uh, the electoral vote count before this meeting at the Warmly House was 165 votes for Hayes and 184 for Tilden. You needed 185 to win. Tilden needed just one more vote, one of those three states. Total of 20 votes were in contention. Hayes wins all 20. He gets 185 votes, Tilden gets 184. It's the only uh, electoral college uh, presidential totals that had a one vote difference. Uh, so 185 to 184, Hayes wins by a single vote. Uh, again, Tilden needed just one state. Uh, Tilden, of course, won all three of those southern states. Uh, review, federal troops removed. That happened in 1877. Reconstruction ended, uh, and basically slavery continued until the 1960s, it can be argued, until Lyndon Johnson. But Reconstruction ended 1877. Uh, one southerner in a cabin that happened in the cabinet. That happened 1877. <clears throat> a railroad across the South and the industrialization of the South didn't happen till the 1930s. <clears throat> and that was due to Franklin Roosevelt programs uh, to rebuild the economy during the Great Depression. And these three Southern states <clears throat> do indeed cast their votes for Hayes again 1877. So some people called this a compromise, some called it a de declaration, some called it a fraud. Uh, the committee of 1877, okay, first you had this Wormley House agreement, and that was negotiations between Republicans and the South. Well, now to make the election look official, it was decided a committee would uh, decide. And it was made up of five members of the House of Representatives, five United States senators, and five Supreme Court justices. Uh, eight of them were Republicans and seven were Democrats. Here's a picture of any old meeting, but of course no women were allowed at this meeting in uh, 18, uh, took place in 1877. The vote, eight to seven in favor of Hayes with eight Republicans and seven uh, Democrats voting along party lines. So no surprise. Uh, unto that power he doeth, doeth, doth belong which only doeth right while ever willing wrong. Uh, you make it look like you're doing something right, you're really doing something wrong. The philosopher Goethe uh, said that. A political cartoon from the day uh, is on the right of the screen there. <clears throat> Roscoe Conkling, dressed in red to look like the devil, was a major player in this uh, compromise and walking away in the background with one of his mistresses is James Garfield, also a major player in seeing to it that Hayes became president. Uh, nicknames for Hayes developed as a result of these uh, shenanigans, president de facto, the usurper, and Rutherford B. Hayes, that's my favorite. Uh, Hayes's inauguration. Uh, there were actually two inaugurations, which is interesting. Now, pre there was a long wait up until the 1930s between the election in November and the inauguration, which was to be on the 4th of March. 
uh, uh, the following year. Uh, that was changed in the 1930s to January 20th. Uh, a lot of people think it ought to be changed to sometime in December now. At any rate, two inaugurations. One was on the 3rd of March, the day before uh, the date specified by the Constitution. And it was a private ceremony uh, in the executive mansion that Hayes had uh, moved into. Uh, the, it was called the executive mansion at the time. Today it's called the White House. Uh, Teddy Roosevelt didn't like um, these uh, highfalutin terms. So he said, um, when he became president, he said, I don't want it called the executive mansion, just call it the White House. It doesn't sound so mansion-y or palace-like. Or... And uh, it was Teddy Roosevelt who also changed what the president was called. Uh, the president had always been called Your Excellency. And Teddy Roosevelt said, call me Mr. President. Second inauguration, first one was March 3rd, Saturday. Next one was Monday, March 5th of 1877, and it was in public. And this is uh, that inauguration at the um, uh, Capitol building. Uh, the reason given was uh, there's a fear of violence because of the nature of the decision as to who would be president for the next four years. Why wasn't it on the required day of Sunday, March 4th of 1877? It's because Hayes was religious. You can't do stuff on Sundays. It's okay to steal an election, but don't get inaugurated on the Sabbath. Um, Many referred to this as the immoral inauguration. Uh, there were no inaugural balls either. Dancing is a sin. So that was a uh, thing that got canceled from uh, tradition, uh, although it uh, was just for this particular uh, inaugural period. So no work on Sunday, no dancing, that's immoral cheating on a presidential election, restoring slavery, ending reconstruction, uh, well, that's gonna be just okay. This is a Thomas Nast political cartoon from the period, and it shows the hand of Tilden, who won the election but didn't take office, and his hand is suppressing and over the hand of uh, one of his supporters who has his hand on a gun, and there were calls for revolution, take over the White House. Tilden said, forget about it. I concede this election is over, uh, and it's been decided, and stop this kind of thinking. Thomas Nast is the same guy <clears throat> who uh, developed the symbols for the Republican and Democratic Party, and he made the Republican Party an elephant. He was uh, a uh, Republican himself, and elephants were credited with being very wise and smart and big memories, and he thought those were good characteristics for the Republican Party. And then he said the Democratic Party is a donkey. And that's actually a kind term uh, that I used. Uh, what Nass said is the Democrats are a jackass. Uh, so Tilden told his supporters to stand down, not stand by. Uh, we're going to do four more elections uh, of a more recent nature uh, from this uh, uh, 20th century time period. Let's take a look at the election of 1960. Uh, this was Richard Nixon and John F. Kennedy. 
And this really was the first presidential debate. We often talk about Lincoln doing the first debate. Well, he did with Stephen Douglas, but it was for the senatorship in Illinois, and it was in 1858. So in reality, this was uh, really uh, the first debate between presidential candidates. Uh, so the first modern, called the first modern debate. Uh, Kennedy had shaved right before they went on TV, so he looked clean shaven. Uh, and Kennedy's uh, advisors were pretty hip about television. You know, this is 1960. Uh, lots of people own TVs, but TV was only, it was less, you know, there were TV stations in the late 1940s but most people were buying TVs in the 1950s. Politicians really didn't know how to use it yet. This was similar to the invention of radio and the microphone, and all of a sudden you had to have a good voice. Well, now with TV, all of a sudden you have to look good also. Uh, Kennedy's people called the TV station, said, what's the background gonna be like? And they said, well, it's gonna be gray. So they told Kennedy, wear a dark suit, you'll stand out against the background. Kennedy also rested all day, wanted to be ready and perky for the debate that night, and he wore makeup. Nixon, to the contrary here, uh, wore a gray suit that blended in with the background, and he campaigned that day. He refused makeup, he didn't shave. Uh, so Kennedy had all the uh, bells and whistles going for looking good. Uh, the decision about the election, however, revolves around Chicago, Illinois. Uh, the big cities in Illinois, Chicago, of course, uh, they had voting machines. So they would just have to total the voting machines and they easily could get their totals out pretty fast after the polls closed at eight o'clock. Rural areas took much longer. Uh, they had to hand count ballots. Uh, so it might be midnight or even the next morning before a lot of the rural areas in all states uh, were able to report what their vote was. But Chicago, uh, there's a big but here. Chicago was controlled by Richard Daley, who was the mayor there, and he was a Democrat. And he said, um, we're not gonna report these totals here. It's nine o'clock. We're gonna sit on them. Uh, I wanna wait and see what the totals are from the rural areas in Illinois. So he held out. He wanted to know how do I have to fix the vote here in Chicago so that it's a greater win for Kennedy than Nixon got in the uh, rural areas of Illinois? Uh, and uh, Daly was able to do that. He reported the Chicago vote with a big enough win by Kennedy over Nixon to take care of the uh, winning total of Nixon out state. So why didn't Nixon challenge this? You know, it was pretty obvious. Uh, everybody knew about it. Newspapers were reporting it. The reason? Uh, Nixon had cheated on the out state vote. And that would have been discovered in an investigation. Uh, Kennedy and Daley, uh, they had a close relationship. Uh, and one of the reasons was not just simply being Democrats, but being Irish Catholics. Irish had had a tremendous amount of trouble uh, during their periods of immigration. 
Uh, you know, help wanted, Irish need not apply was uh, not an uncommon sign. Uh, the United States has been a WASP country, W-A-S-P, white, Anglo-Saxon, Protestant. Uh, one Catholic had run for president in 1928 and lost to Herbert Hoover, that was Al Smith. Uh, Kennedy ended up becoming the first uh, Catholic to win the presidency. Uh, so there was a, uh, an affinity between uh, these two men because of uh, a lot of the um, difficulties that Irish and Catholics had faced uh, previously. Here's a couple pictures. Which one of them is the tallest? Actually, it was Kennedy. Uh, for some reason, that picture on the left, he must be standing a stair step down or something. Uh, the Kennedys were also very close with Joe McCarthy, famous for the McCarthy era, accusing lots of people of being communists and the government being full of communists. Bobby Kennedy, uh, John F. Kennedy's brother <coughs> actually worked on McCarthy's team. Uh, here are a couple pictures of them together. Uh, and McCarthy would frequently get invited to the Kennedy compound uh, and even dated one of the Kennedy sisters many times. <coughs> Excuse me. Again, uh, they're both Irish Catholics, uh, McCarthy and uh, the Kennedys, and, uh, and again, they had to stick together. Uh, people of their beliefs were uh, generally faced exclusion in politics. <coughs> the Republicans argued, well, Nixon, Nixon won 93 of Illinois, 102 counties. How can he not have won the state? Uh, in 1960, there were 10.1 million people in Illinois. That was the state's population. But half of that number were in the six counties uh, that include Chicago and its suburbs. So you've, uh, uh, you know, basically what you've got there is um, a geographic argument the Republicans, Nixon won 93 of the 102 counties. The reality is you need to use a population argument. Half the state's population lives in just six counties. <coughs> the election of 1972. Uh, this was uh, Richard Nixon and George McGovern. And uh, Nixon had barely lost in 1960. He lost uh, uh, that 1960 election to Kennedy. Uh, and we've talked about the role Chicago played in that. And it was, uh, it was a very close election. Then Nixon barely won in 1968. He ran against Hubert Humphrey and Humphrey lost by a uh, you know, less than half a million votes. Um, so Nixon was concerned. Okay, I'm running again in 1972. Uh, what do I need to do to win? What he did is he created a gang of crooks uh, called the Plumbers. And here they are after they'd been arrested uh, they were caught breaking into Democratic National Headquarters. However, uh, that wasn't the only time they broke into something. They were breaking in to corporate headquarters and stealing stationery. And the corporations they'd break into were corporations where the head of the company or many of its uh, employees had made major contributions to the McGovern campaign. So they got this stationery uh, by breaking into these companies that were more democratic in, in uh, attitude. And uh, 
And then they use that stationery to write letters to McGovern saying, you got to get rid of your vice president. This man who was his choice, Thomas Eagleton, who was from uh, Missouri. And the, uh, the stuff that they had against Eagleton was he'd had a nervous breakdown. What if something happens to you? We got a guy then who's president and he's had a nervous breakdown. McGovern paid uh, close attention to that, saying, uh, oh boy, um, I, better, uh, I better get rid of Eagleton, which he did. And he appointed um, uh, the Kennedy brother-in-law, uh, and I'm blocking on his name right now. Uh, Sergeant Shriver. Uh, Sergeant Shriver, thanks, Judy. And uh, appointed uh, Sergeant Shriver as his new running mate. Uh, Nixon's in a lot of trouble. Uh, the House uh, Judiciary Committee has voted to send articles of impeachment to the United States Senate. Nixon is visited by three Republicans. And uh, they include on the left there, Hugh Scott, who was the Republican leader in the Senate where the trial of Nixon would occur. And in the middle, Barry Goldwater, who in 64 uh, was the Republican presidential nominee and was a senator at this time uh, from Arizona. And, uh, and John Rhodes, pictured on the right, Rhodes was the House Republican uh, leader. And these three guys visited Nixon in the Oval Office and they gave Nixon some bad news. Nixon was told that um, you have 15 votes in the Senate. You need 34 to uh, be found not guilty of the impeachment. It required a two thirds majority which is 67 votes. Uh, and then these guys left and had a press conference, which is what you see a photograph of here. So uh, Nixon goes, oh boy. And that was the end of that. Uh, the consequence was Nixon decided to resign rather than face impeachment. Uh, the election of 2000. Uh, George uh, W. Bush and Al Gore, um, uh, Florida, as you can see, it's one of the states uh, with a panhandle. Uh, there's half a dozen of them. Look on a map for fun. Most people can name Florida and they can name Oklahoma, but there's other states that have panhandles also. Uh, the Florida vote was very close. And everybody figured, well, we need to do a recount here. And the uh, Florida governor said, no, we're not going to do a recount. And the Florida governor was uh, supported by the Secretary of State. Secretary of State is the person that's in charge of state elections. Sorry, that's uh, my phone ringing. Um, the uh, so there's going to be no recount. Well, both of these people, the Florida governor and its secretary of state, are Republicans. So they support George W. Bush. And uh, uh, this, this uh, state will make a difference in the election. So they want to keep it as a win for Bush. They don't want to uh, see a recount maybe change who won, wins their state. An amazing thing, who's the governor of Florida? Jeb Bush, brother to George W. And the Florida Secretary of State is Katherine Harris. A famous story that went around at the time was, um, okay, we're in Africa and we're in the Republic of the Congo and a man runs for president and um, his brother refuses to do a recount 
and his brother is the governor of one of the provinces. See, and it makes it sound like something a third world country would be involved in. And then you conclude telling the story by saying, this is Jeb Bush in Florida and his brother, uh, George, in the 2000 election. Uh, some states require an automatic uh, recount uh, if somebody wins by less than 1%, and uh, Florida does not. And that certainly was the case in Florida. Uh, this vote was far less than 1%. As a matter of fact, it was just 537 votes out of 5.8 million that were cast, that's a difference of one one hundredth of 1% of the votes cast. So you can see this was mighty close. Uh, there was uh, Ralph uh, Nader was running as a third party candidate in 2000. And he, got, he won 96,000 votes in Florida. Uh, those are votes that probably would have gone to Gore. Uh, lots of people in Florida were interviewed uh, after this 2000 election who had voted for uh, Ralph Nader. And of course, they were all saying, well, gee, I wish I hadn't done that. Uh, at any rate, um, what's going to happen next? Well, uh, Florida Democrats say, okay, we're going to sue. We think there should be a recount. Some states require it by law when an election is this close. So we're going to take it to the Supreme Court. Uh, the Supreme Court agrees to hear it in within a few days even. You know, usually uh, it's uh, five to seven years before the Supreme Court agrees to hear a case. And so this happened pretty fast. Uh, and the Supreme Court said, yeah, you have to do a recount. And they further said, you've got four days to complete the recount. Well, you're recounting 5.8 million votes. They're being done by hand. Another problem with Florida was uh, they used a punch card to cast their vote. And sometimes the chad that pops out didn't pop out. It was left hanging well, are we going to count that or not? So these ballots all had to be looked at individually, and it, it just became a mess. There was no day. No, there, were, there was absolutely no way you could get this recount done within four days. Remember the 12th Amendment? If no president by inauguration day, the sitting vice president becomes president, until the decision is made. So they could have carried this recount out as long as they wanted. There was a provision in the Constitution for what to do in such a, such a situation. Uh, this is Chief Justice William Rehnquist, who oversaw this decision. They should have read the Constitution uh, Rehnquist, at his hearing to be a justice, uh, had many witnesses who said, we saw him in voting lines in Arizona when he was an attorney there, telling Hispanics and Blacks to go home. Same thing happened. He's nominated for chief justice. He has to go through hearings again. Same thing. People come in from Arizona and testify that he sent home Hispanics and Blacks, intimidated them, etc. Election of 2004. Uh, this is George W. Bush and John Kerry. Uh, George W. Bush is the incumbent president. He is um, uh, running for a second term, and John Kerry is the Democratic nominee. Playing a big role in this election is Diebolt Corporation. They make uh, voting machines, 
and their voting machines were used throughout Ohio. Pictured here is Weldon O'Dell, who was the president or chief executive officer, CEO of uh, Diebolt voting machines. He met with George W. Bush and a bunch of Bush contributors at Bush's ranch in Crawford, Texas, and then publicly stated that George W. Bush would win in 2004. Uh, and uh, they were the official voting machine in Ohio. Now, what Diebolt uh, said was, uh, election judges, like any, any time we have to open up a machine, they wanna look and see what we're doing, make sure we're not messing with the vote totals. But we're not gonna allow that because when we take the back off our voting machines, there's a lot of proprietary information in there, things we don't want our competitors to know. So uh, we're worried about election judges seeing that. So we don't want any of them to uh, look uh, into the backs of our machines. Ken Blackwell, another major player in Ohio, he's their secretary of state and in charge of elections, said several times in the year leading up to the election that W would win in Ohio. Uh, Blackwell also decided what voting machines to buy, and as I've stated, he bought uh, voting machines uh, from Diebolt. Here's how the vote uh, was. There were uh, uh, like 5.6 uh, million votes cast in Ohio. Uh, Bush wins by a hundred and 19,000 approximately, but the exit polls showed different results. You know, pollsters would stand at the exits and they would ask people, how did you vote? And then those surveys would be released the night of the election. And the exit polls showed that Kerry had won. This is the only time in the history of exit pollings that they have been wrong. The exit polls showed a carry win of over 300,000 votes. So Ohio became the deciding state. It had 20 electoral votes. Subtract 20 from Bush, he's at 266. Add 20 to Kerry, he's at 271. Kerry is the winner of the election nationally. Uh, assuming that the exit polls were correct. This is uh, Mark Crispin Miller, professor of media studies, or was at uh, New York University, and he wrote a book, Fooled Again. And he said 2004 was a fraudulent election, just like the 2000 election was. His book uh, is still available. Uh, you can buy it on Amazon. I just looked it up yesterday if you're interested. And uh, he uh, has a large section in the book about how to stop fraudulent elections. <clears throat> Another uh, anecdote from uh, Ohio, Franklin County, Ohio, it had several precincts. One precinct in particular, which of course was using Diebolt computerized voting machines, uh, recorded a total of 4,254 votes for Bush. That was 94% of all the votes cast. Kerry in that precinct got 260 votes. That was 6% of all the votes that were cast. Uh, that's a total of 4,318 votes cast. Interesting thing about the precinct was it had 800 registered voters. If voting counted for anything, you would not be allowed to do it. This was a statement by Emma Goldman. <clears throat> she was a uh, radical political person uh, back at the turn of the last century, uh, the early 1900s, 
was finally deported from the U.S. Uh, back to her home country of Russia and happened to be in Russia <clears throat> and became an instrumental part of the Russian Revolution. Uh, topics next week, uh, we'll talk about uh, voter suppression, and I'll run through these quickly. Uh, there is voter suppression in the U.S. Constitution. We'll talk about it. Uh, voter IDs, uh, what's the problem with requiring a voter ID? Uh, language access, should you have to speak English? Uh, purging voter rolls. Uh, we don't think anybody that's ever been convicted of a felony should be allowed to vote. What's happened with that uh, uh, piece of voter suppression? Uh, polling places. Well, uh, this particular county used to have 8,000 polling places. Now uh, we have 400. We'll talk about those kinds of issues. Gerrymandering has been around from day one uh, this is creating congressional districts uh, that are decidedly going to vote for one political party or another. We'll talk about the history of it, <clears throat> show you some of the current gerrymandered districts. Uh, early voting, uh, the major issue here is how long can you do it? Voting hours, uh, we used to do uh, six in the morning till eight at night. Now we're gonna do 10 in the morning till six at night. Um, <clears throat> at large voting. This is where uh, an entire city votes for the city council and you vote for four members, as opposed to having districts. And we'll explain that in greater detail next week. The poll tax. The literacy test, you gotta pay to vote. You gotta be able to read or write. We'll talk about those issues. Absentee voting, whether or not to count those ballots. A partisan election administrators. What about judges at the election who say they're constantly challenging someone's right to vote? A lack of funding. Uh, are elections, do elections need more money? Uh, provisional ballots. Well, that person, I don't know about that person. Give them a provisional ballot and then those ballots aren't counted until after the election and only if it looks like they'd make a difference. Uh, there was a law passed in <clears throat> southern states. You can't vote if your grandfather was a slave. I'll give you a history of that and uh, it eventually went to the Supreme Court. Uh, the labor environment, uh, and this involves working hours on an election day. Uh, voter intimidation uh, while you're standing in line, uh, lies to people about who can and who can't vote, uh, Supreme Court situations that have involved voter suppression, and I wrote all of this <clears throat> about three months ago. Well, I had to go back and add census taking. Uh, the census, or people wanted to cut short this year, so you count less people. And the post office became an issue in the election we're currently awaiting. And uh, that's it for today. Uh, Judy's gonna take over with some questions. Thanks, Judy. Okay, well, we do have a number of questions. Um, the first one is, please restate what happens if one of the candidate dies between the election and the electoral college and the meeting of the electoral college. Uh, what has, uh, uh, this has happened, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, uh, uh, a, a Democratic candidate um, died after the election, but before the uh, Electoral College met. And they, they just said, nobody can vote for him. He's dead. And that was back in the 1800s. And, and, and then what happened? 
the uh, they, cast, they cast their votes for other candidates. Okay. Oh, I see. All right. Okay. Next question. In 1876, there was a campaign of terror against black voters in the South. How would, uh, no, I'm sorry, who would have won the popular vote if votes had been honestly counted, including those black voters, in South Carolina, Mississippi, and the other Confederate states? Well, uh, that I don't know. But yes, uh, uh, those black voters would have voted in a very large majority for the Republican Party, because that's the party that ended slavery. Mm -hmm. and, uh, <clears throat> and blacks in the South were not allowed to vote. So um, uh, what the, uh, there was a sizable population of blacks across the South too. As a matter of fact, in the state of Mississippi, they were a majority of the population. So it's, uh, that could have made a difference. And indeed, Hayes would have been the winner if blacks had been allowed to vote. Mm -hmm. And this questioner says, didn't the election of 1800 go to the House when Jefferson and Aaron Burr tied? Uh, and could you talk about that a little? Uh, I don't know a great deal about it, and I don't even know whether or not it went to the House. My understanding is that was just a kind of a, an agreement, but I'd, I'd have to look it up. But yeah, uh, there was um, that election, uh, Burr and Jefferson had previously agreed that um, if there's a tie, I get to be president and you can be vice president. And that ended up being what happened, but Burr didn't go along with it as he had agreed to. And uh, that's the most I can say about it. Okay. Yeah, just based on what I know. Okay. Um, this questioner says, was gerrymandering uh, worse in the 18th century uh, than it is today? And I think he means the 19th century, but well, uh, oh, yeah. but was it worse in the past, let's say, than it is today? If not, when did gerrymandering begin to seriously distort representation to a legislative body? Well, it began in the early 1800s, and Elbridge Gerry uh, is the man that it's named for. He was a leading uh, politician in the early 1800s and uh, did it in the state of Massachusetts. Uh, he was governor and um, uh, that's where the name comes from. It's, been, it's the oldest form of voter suppression that there is. I think it's far worse today. Uh, there are 435 congressional districts in the United States. 100 of them are gerrymandered. I mean, that's almost a, almost a fourth. Um, there was a case uh, 10 years ago where uh, the uh, uh, Oklahoma legislature was going to determine congressional districts, and that was controlled by Republicans, and the Democrats left the state. The Democratic representatives packed up and left the state, and then when the, when the uh, state legislature met, they couldn't form a quorum. Consequently, they couldn't redistrict until the Republicans would talk with the Democrats about trying to make it a more fair process. Um, anyway, it's, uh, I think it's a much larger problem today. I have a large section next week where I'll talk about this and I'll show you many of these gerrymandered districts. And it's going to be very interesting over the next three years to see what happens with this. Uh, even though the census has been taken now, uh, it still takes a while for the state legislatures to actually do the redistricting. Uh, they have to come to agreements, et cetera. So even though the census is virtually completed, uh, the redistricting will take uh, 
two or three years yet. And the, the bias in redistricting is getting out all the questions that are business related so that businessmen know how to adjust their advertising. Uh, and we'll talk about all of that next week. Okay, uh, the next question has to do with the 1960 election in uh, Illinois. Uh, this questioner says, uh, Daley cheated because he held back the Chicago vote totals until rural votes were available. Did he change the rural vote? Uh, what did he do exactly that was illegal? And I'm going to add something to that that I'm interested in. I had heard, of course, that Daley had held back the Chicago vote, uh, but I never heard that the reason Nixon didn't challenge is because Nixon had been cheating in the uh, outstate vote. So could you talk about, you know, both those things? What did Daley do and what did the Nixon people do in Illinois in, Chicago, in uh, 1960? Well, it was simply a matter of uh, increasing the vote totals for the candidate they wanted to win. Um, I don't know what more I can say about it, except that, um, uh, you know, uh, that's uh, the guy with the most votes wins, and there were people around who could uh, influence that, affect that, uh, make it... Uh, something other than what the actual vote totals were. And I talked about that today with the Ohio vote and the exit polls being different and that one precinct. Uh, that's about as much as I can say about it, I guess. Um, okay, I, I, you know, do you, do you, could you say anything about the actual techniques that they used? I've always heard about dead voters and things like that. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, the um, uh, people uh, the, you can uh, people can vote twice. Mm -hmm. uh, you can say certain people can't vote, uh, and you know that this person can't vote. Yet there's six people in the precinct with exactly the same name, so you cancel all of them out. Uh -huh. uh, that's a, that's another thing that is done, and. When the votes are counted, you simply change them. I see. Yeah. Okay, we'll uh, move on to which, the next. Which is obviously what happened in that Ohio Franklin mm -hmm. County precinct. Right. And uh, before the next question, maybe I could uh, draw attention to the background I have. Uh, you can see the White House on your right. And inside the grounds for the White House is the executive office building, which you can see. Uh, right behind my head. I'll lean over a bit. <laughs> and that's where uh, people who work for the president or work in the executive branch are housed there. So that's what my background image has been today. And uh, during the uh, uh, Truman presidency, the White House was falling apart. You know, it had been built 150 years earlier and was built with wood beams and they were rotting and the White House was totally gutted. Nobody could meet in there. Truman couldn't live there. Truman uh, housed his uh, uh, office in this executive uh, building here. Uh, thanks. Okay, before we leave that question, I just have to uh, uh, interject here, I got a comment from one of the viewers. Uh, this person says, uh, 1960 wasn't the only election where there was that kind of cheating. I grew up in Illinois, so she knew. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, that, uh, there, there's, uh, uh, you know, a Daley was a long-term resident. He may have cheated on his own votes <coughs> in Chicago. Um, yeah. yeah. Okay, uh, moving Thanks. on. We've got about 10 more minutes, uh, so I hope we get through the questions. Um, okay, so this person says, so in 1877, the Republicans, party of Lincoln, abandoned the South. Why? What did they do with the power achieved in the 1876 election? Uh, what the Republican Party did basically in 1876 was they, they left the civil rights 
aspect that they had been founded on and went to business. Uh, there's a excellent book called uh, Economic Development in the Latter Third of the 19th Century by Jeffrey Williamson at the University of Chicago. <clears throat> and that is the period of time, basically end of the Civil War to 1900, when um, big businesses came into existence. Manufacturing started like crazy. And uh, <clears throat> the Republican Party saw that as their future. And that has shifted occasionally. Uh, Teddy Roosevelt didn't buy into it. He passed an incredible amount of legislation as a Republican, uh, controlling corporations and businesses and overseeing them, et cetera. Uh, but by the time you hit the 1920s and Harding, Coolidge, uh, Hoover, they were very much the party of uh, American businesses. And so basically, I guess, uh, you know, when you boil it all down, I'd say they, they left the, their civil rights agenda and took up a business agenda and being okay. favorable to businesses. All right. <coughs> the next question is, what was the final tally in Florida after the recount in 2000? Well, there wasn't enough time to finish that recount. It basically didn't count. And I, I really don't know. I guess I'd want to look it up. I'm assuming it was still the 537 votes done during the original recount. Another interesting thing about it is the people that were doing the recounting were in a big room that had glass windows from the hallway and you could look in and see the room where the counting was being done. And people were allowed in and they had placards and signs and stop the count and angry and shouting. And uh, so that was a thing that was influencing the people that were doing the counting, but the counting really never got restarted. And uh, here's a comment, I think, related to this answer that you just gave. This person says, Florida did not have a state standard for voter intent, as Minnesota has long had. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure what, it, what is a standard for voter intent. What does that mean? I don't know. OK. Well, maybe this commenter could uh, respond again if we have time. <laughs> if I'll move on to the next. If it's how the ballot is marked, mm -hmm. that could make a difference. Uh, and that's basically with this, um, where you punch out a chad as you had to in the Florida ballot. Um, then you could look and see what was the intent. And you'd have ballots there where there was a slight depression made with the tool onto the chad of an opponent, but then the opponent, the, the other person running in that category had actually had their chad pulled out. So did they accidentally vote for the guy where the chad was missing and then intended to vote for the guy where the chad had obviously been punched but not removed? Or was it vice versa? from that. So what was the voter intent? I in Minnesota, you fill in a blank space. The way voter intent could be uh, difficult there is if you fill in two of the uh, boxes for two presidential candidates, who had you intended to vote for? And of course, what you're supposed to do is say, my ballot was mismarked you go tell a voting judge, they give you a new ballot. Uh, but some people maybe didn't do that. They might have started to mark one box and oh, oh wait, I meant to mark the one below that. And, uh, that's what voter intent is about and how it's measured. But what the laws are, I don't know. Okay. <clears throat> the next question is kind of a 
a pessimist as must have asked this question if he says um, <clears throat> with four questionable presidential elections in the past 60 years why should any american continue to believe in a just electoral system uh i agree <laughs> okay um yeah we've had more trouble i mean there's been six of these elections out of a total of 59 elections in U.S. history uh, that have had these kinds of difficulties that we know about. And, uh, and uh, two-thirds of them are in our lifetimes, of most of us in this uh, meeting anyway. Um, so yeah, it's gotten, it's gotten worse. And uh, just since 2000, there's been a couple, you know, it's, um, I'm pessimistic. Uh, I've had this argument with a lot of people, colleagues and friends, and, and uh, there's a, there, there are a lot of people out there that believe we have very good elections in the United States. I think certainly we do in Minnesota, but, um, I'm concerned. I, when I was working at the Humphrey Institute, Kirk Carlson used to pay a speaker every quarter to come to the Humphrey Institute. And it'd be some person of, that was pretty famous. And he paid them $25,000 for the speaking engagement. One quarter, it was Jimmy Carter. A student stood up and asked Carter, What's the worst election you've ever been involved in? Now, Carter used to judge elections all around the world. Everybody expected him to say something like, Guatemala. He said, when I ran for the state Senate in Georgia. <laughs> and uh, another student stood up and said, why don't you judge an election in the United States? And he said, because the United States will never meet my requirements, one of which is the ballot has to be the same everywhere. It has to look the same. It has to be marked the same. And we're a country where local authorities determine all of this. Um, so I, 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 I agree with the questioner on that case. I, I'd really like to see well, I guess I'd like my own doubts to be uh, dealt with, I guess. Okay, we're almost out of time. We've got one minute left here, and there is one last question, uh, so maybe a really quick answer. The question is, why can't the president and vice president be from the same state? Well, I think uh, people were worried about too much power in a single location. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, that was written when there were just 13 states. And uh, Virginia was the dominant state. Uh, and people were worried that Virginia would overpower them, especially northern people. Virginia was a slave state. So, and, you know, they didn't want two people with the same exact background, kind of. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm afraid we're out of time. Um, thank you very much, everyone uh, who attended today, and we'll see you next time. So thank you, JB, and thank you, audience. Bye-bye now. Bye.